So now we get out to that very high level of diversification called unrelated diversification. This is where a company really doesn't try to do much sharing. It's all about the management headquarters. So part of the idea is management or leadership uh, as a core competency. In other words, we just know how to run businesses better than other people do. Sometimes it's about that buy low, take a company in, fix it up, and then sell it again. And sometimes it's about this idea of when we have very different businesses, uh, we can allocate cash from one that is performing well into one that's currently in a down cycle, but we know it's a great company so that when the market recovers, they're in a great place to succeed. This is one that in theory works great, in practice just, just not, does not, just has not worked very well at all. But in theory, it seems like it ought to be so. So the company that I want to use as a case study for unrelated diversification is a company that none of you've probably heard of. And that is a company called Danaher. Uh, this is a company that was founded in the 80s. At one point had over 66,000 employees. They split the company uh, in two not too long ago. And so uh, that caused the company to be a little bit uh, different sized keep trying to get it right, but what I want to show you are their businesses. They have three major uh, different types of divisions. It's life sciences, environmental and applied, and diagnostics. And you can see the different companies that they have. And like I said, this is a company that's already spun itself off or split itself in two. And the other company's name that they split off is Fortive. Since 1984, Danaher bought over 400 companies. In some cases, they combined them, um, but in a lot of cases, they bought and then sold if things didn't work out or sold if things were, if it was suddenly very valuable. Here's what Danaher shares. Danaher shares the idea of lean manufacturing. Those of you that had Dr. Patterson's class, know, well, all of you should have, or you're in it now, uh, you know what lean manufacturing is. That's really all that Danaher says. They say, we know manufacturing and we know how to do lean manufacturing and they put that system in. They call it the Danaher business system. Typical of an unrelated diversification business, they had, like I say at their peak, 66,000 employees. Imagine the headquarters of a 66,000 employee company. How many people would you think would be in the corporate headquarters? And the answer was less than 200. What? Less than 200? What did they have in corporate headquarters? They didn't have HR because HR is every company's responsibility. They didn't have marketing because marketing is every company's responsibility. They don't have corporate R&D. R&D is every company's responsibility. They probably have some corporate legal offices uh, and they do have some financial offices because what Danaher says is, and this is the bottom line, they hire leaders of their companies and they give them financial targets. And one of two things happens. The leaders of their company, of those companies, and so what I mean is like the leaders of, of, of these businesses, they hit their, their targets or they hit the unemployment line. Danaher fires them, they go out and they find somebody who will hit their targets. And that's why they have such a small corporate headquarters. All they do at corporate headquarters is keep score and recruit CEOs and fire CEOs. Simple as that. And that's typical of uh, a unrelated diversification business. Now, what everybody's gonna tell you is that unrelated diversification is out, but Danaher has been extremely successful. That new CEO of GE that was brought in to save the company, Larry Culp, former CEO of Danaher, he made so much money, he retired in his early 50s. Um, and was recruited to the board of directors of GE several years ago, and they turned to him when GE needed saving. The textbook does a good job of talking about why diversification came about historically. The idea of antitrust laws and taxation is why many companies chose to become highly diversified and how the antitrust law and tax laws have changed and have removed a lot of those incentives in the United States. A lot of the overseas conglomerates became that way because there wasn't an efficient way to use resource or, or, or to allocate capital. And then the other value neutral thing they talk about is companies sometimes engage in diversification because their core business is failing. 
And then the idea of underused resources. This goes back to my initial illustration of the, the guy who had the lawn care business. He, was, he himself was an underused resource. You see this like, for example, go to a lot of ski mountains in the summer. And what do you find? You found my, mountain bike trails and uh, little um, slides where people can come down the mountain. So they're trying to take the, the, that resource, which is the mountain and the lift system, and use it in different ways in the summer so that they get more out of it. And so that's that's a sort of a diversification strategy. The textbook says this is always a losing strategy. I would amend that to say it's almost always a losing strategy, but sometimes people do it pretty well. So this is, I'm gonna rip, rip this over here so you don't see this. Ah, it's not gonna work. So the question is, other bad reasons to diversify or to reduce the risk and increase pay and prestige. Okay, so let's look at Samsung. Samsung botched the Note 7 phone in the fall of 16. Remember the batteries that blew up? How badly did they suffer? Profits suffer. Look at that. They went from, from not having a bad year the next year to having a great year. How was that possible? They didn't have all their eggs in the Note 7 basket. Samsung, is a very, Samsung Electronics is a highly diversified business. They make, for example, chips that Apple puts in their smartphones. And so as much as, as easy it is to trash these diversified businesses, hmm, sometimes it really does work out pretty well. To sum up, really unrelated diversification is out. Uh, although it was in because of the tax and antitrust reasons for a long time. Many firms are even pulling further back from the diversification and becoming more focused on their core businesses. And the research says that by being fairly low levels of diversification is probably your optimum level. If you're not diversified at all, maybe that's not the best, but certainly if you become unrelated, that's not the best. But those are averages, and averages are never the complete story. If we talk about the greatest investor of all time, or at least in modern times, who does everybody say that is? Oh, that's, that's Warren Buffett. And what's his company? Berkshire Hathaway. So let's just take a look at some of the companies in Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. The Acme Brick Company, doesn't that sound like something that comes out of the Roadrunner cartoon? Believe it or not, it's headquartered in uh, Fort Worth. The, the real home of, or the start of Berkshire Hathaway was insurance. So they have Geico, General Re is another insurance company, Diamond Sales Stores, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, a railroad, NetJets, a jet leasing company. So you can see they're in a lot of different businesses. And what, what's Warren Buffett's strategy? I find a good industry, I buy a company, I put in a good leadership team, and I leave them alone for a decade. And it's worked pretty well for him. So even though we talk about diversification and say it just doesn't happen much anymore, it still does work. So now let's talk for just a minute about Globus. I've given you quite a bit of time to work on Globus today if you wish to do so. In class on Wednesday, I handed out some strategies about how you might want to employ your round one. If you haven't given it any thought whatsoever, uh, this could be a good time for you to talk with your teammates and just make some strategic decisions about how you're going to pursue it. The computer has been reset, so the slate has been wiped clean, and you're back to the very beginning, and you can begin to make your decisions now. I want to tell you specifically what will happen with J Company, my company that's uh, there in the bottom of the industry. I am not going to make any decisions except I'm going to raise all my prices by 20%. I do not expect that you're going to follow me in so doing. All I'm doing is raising my prices. So I'm just flopping on the ground saying, everybody come and take my business away from me. And so that'll be easy for you all to pick my bones clean on that. <clears throat> and I won't make any subsequent decisions unless the industry begins to really raise, if you begin to really raise your prices, then I'll raise my prices even more so that I'm never an attractive option. And usually after about two years, I'll just delete my company because I'll have been picked down to nothing and I'll get myself out of the way. But do take advantage of this time for Globus. Lord Wellen, I will see you Wednesday morning and be back from the frozen land and we'll be working more on Globus.